Welcome to church today, welcome to everybody that's here and a special welcome to all those online and to all our visitors. Could you please stand while Steve brings in the Bible. Thanks Steve. You may be seated. We bring the Bible in before us to just remind us that it's uh, everything that we do is the word of, is in the word of the God. So our call to worship today comes from Psalm 89 verses 20 to 37. I have found David my servant with my sacred oil I have anointed him. My hand will sustain him, surely my arm will strengthen him. No any enemy will subject him to tribute. No wicked man will oppress him. I will crush his foes before him and strike down his adversaries. My faithful love will be with him, and through my name his horn will be exalted. I will set his hand over the sea, his right hand over the rivers. He will call, me, he will call out to me, You are my Father, my God, the Rock, my Saviour. I will also appoint him my firstborn, the most exalted of the kings of the earth. I will maintain my love to him forever, and my covenant with him will never fail. I will establish his line forever, his throne as long as the heavens endure. If his sons forsake my law and do not follow my statutes, if they violate, violate my decrees and, fall, and fail to keep my commands, I will punish their sin with the, with the rod, their iniquity with flogging, but I will not take my love from him nor will I ever betray my faithfulness. I will not violate my covenant or alter what my lips have uttered. Once for all, I have sworn my, by my holiness, I will not lie to David, that his, his line will continue forever and his throne endure before me like the sun. It will be established forever like the moon, the faithful witness in the sky. This is the word of the Lord. The prayer of worship. O Lord, we lift our eyes to see your glory. We open our hearts to receive your love. We engage our minds to understand your truth. We offer our songs to praise your name. Lord, as we give you our lives, please take everything that we are so that we may reveal your blessings to the world. Amen. And our first hymn today will be Garment of Praise. Oh, <laughs> 
are going to read to you the Lord's Prayer, I want you to close your eyes and just hear the words and pray them to yourselves, please. In Lord's Prayer, is Matthew 6, 9 to 19, and it says, This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we will also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Amen. And when I was first, when I read that again the other day, I went, wow, that really spoke to me and we all know the Lord's Prayer yet it really really touched me yet again Mike could you do the children's story please if the kids would like to come forward I'm going to tell you a story it's actually a Christmas story but it has a very interesting uh, thing at the end so I'm going to in, during the story I'll ask you a couple of questions but first of all Uh, if you've got brothers and sisters that I know some of you do, do you ever fight? No? Are you ever mean to your brother or sister? No. Are they ever mean to you? Yes. <laughs> do you ever get angry at your mum and dad? No. Oops. <coughs> Well, this story is about two brothers, and we're going to see the pictures on the screen. That's called Jed, Jed and Roy McCoy, and they were shepherds. Yeah. It was late at night. Is there a picture up there? There's Jed and Roy. It was late at night, and all the sheep were in their beds fast asleep. But, wide awake, glaring at each other across the flock, were the brothers Jed and Roy McCoy. They're looking at each other, looking, looking, looking. My, <laughs> my little girl used to say, when a brother in the back, she said, Dad, Matthew's looking at me. <laughs> well, that's all right. But he's looking with a mean look on his face. If you asked Jed what the problem was, he would say, that ratbag Roy keeps rustling my sheep. Why, just the other day, 25 years ago, he stole my prize ewe. Uh, I didn't see him, but the wolf prints were a dead giveaway. Only Roy would sne- be sneaky enough to wear wolf footprint shoes to cover his tracks. So fair's fair, I put my brand on some of his sheep and put rocks in his wool bale. That's a bit mean, isn't it? Yeah, I think it is too. If you ask Roy what the problem was, he would say, that swamp snake Jed keeps frizzing my sheep. Why, just the other day, 22 years, three months and four days ago, he frizzled my best ram. I knew it was Jed. Who else would sneak out in a thunderstorm, frizzle a ram and make it look like it was a lightning strike? (laughs) But fair's fair. I snapped his staff in two and put a scorpion in his bed because I couldn't find a snake. (laughs) Yes, says, do not put scorpions in here. You don't have to put signs like that up in your... Do you have a sign that says, brothers keep out? Only girls allowed or something like that. 
Once a year, at the big feast, the feuding brothers would put aside their differences and sit at the dinner table and exchange gifts. They look at each other smiling. No, they're not. <coughs> but the next night, things would be back to normal. Jed and Roy McCoy's glaring at each other across the sheep. One night, an angel suddenly appeared and said, Surprise! I have good news. In Bethlehem, a baby has been born who will bring, bring peace on earth. Why has he got a piece of string? Guess cost God likes playing with yo-yos, but he uses angels instead. And it bounces up and down. Well, have you ever been in a play where somebody's an angel and they have to lower them down? They use string. Do they look surprised? Yep, they do. Peace on earth, Jed and Roy were so excited, they ran all the way to Bethlehem. And there in a manger they found the baby. They were filled with joy. Wow, peace on earth. Now, I want you to look at this next picture. Jet, then Jed and Roy looked at each other across the manger. Peace on earth. What will this baby have to do to bring peace on earth? Who do you think the baby is? Do you think it's Jesus? Yes. Yeah, okay. And what will this baby have to do to bring peace on earth? What do you know about that picture? What can you see about that picture that gives you a hint about what will bring peace on earth? It's actually going to be in my message today, but you, there's a baby, and the baby grows up to be Jesus. What happens to Jesus? Can you remember? He sacrificed himself. How did he do that? What? What was the, What did he get sacrificed on? Can you see in the picture something that he might have been sacrificed on? The cross. The cross. Yeah. The bro brothers then ran home rejoicing. Funny thing, from that day on, Jesus, Jesus, Jed, never mentioned stolen ewes, and Roy never mentioned frizzled rams. And at night, Jed and Roy no longer glared at each other across the flock. Instead, one would sleep while the other looked after the sheep. Well, why do you think, what do you think made Jed and Roy change? What was it, do you think, that changed? They met Jesus the baby. They met Jesus the baby. What was Jesus bringing? He was going to bring peace on earth. What else did Jesus bring? He brought some love. And when we, when we know Jesus, he, he, shared, he loves us. And then there was something Jesus said to his followers. He said, love one another, love each other, as I have loved you. And that's what Jed, Roy and Jed thought about. They thought... Maybe we should start loving each other. Is it, is it hard to love little brothers who do mean things to you while you're trying to listen to a story? There's, hey! Satnan, dude. What for you do this thing? What? That's right. Lord! Help the kids to be good and be loving and to forgive each other, even their mean little brothers. 
Amen. Ready? Please stand for our next hymn, We Are Family. chosen that hymn because it take, took me back to when I first became a Christian and one of the first first songs I ever, le- I ever learnt so I was, I was pretty happy about that I will now have um, our read- reading Steve please and then Michael bring the bring the message Our reading this morning comes from uh, the book of Ephesians, 
chapter 2, starting in verse 11. Therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, that done in the body by the hands of men, remember that in that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from the citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, dividing the wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace. And in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him we both have access to the, to the Father by one spirit. Consequently you are no longer foreigners and aliens but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Uh, Good morning. Great to be with you again. Uh, As we work through this message, I want you to notice the uh, symbols on the communion table, the cross, the flags, and the communion cup. And the question for you to ponder is, what's that representing? What's that symbolism saying? Everywhere we look today, In the world, we see uh, conflict, uh, so much conflict and hostility, signs of racial and secular hatred. Uh, Just a couple of high-profile examples. There's the conflict between Israel and Hamas or uh, Palestine. It's actually a conflict between Hamas and Israel the Palestinians, there's an overlap, but a lot of the Palestinian people are sort of caught in the middle of that. Not all Palestinians are supporters of Hamas, but uh, they're caught in a difficult situation. There's the war in the U- Ukraine uh, and the invasion of Russia. Just recently, we saw an escalation in the tension, in the political tension in America with the attempted assassination of Donald Trump and uh, everybody calming, calling for calm and uh, not retaliation. And there are many other examples that we can see throughout the world. Uh, and while Paul is using the term, the div- dividing wall of hostility in a metaphorical way, in a metaphorical sense, we've seen in the 20th century uh, physical realities of this. There was the Berlin Wall, which was put up. We see barbed wire fences, minefields separating North and South Korea. And uh, while Donald Trump was president, we saw the the building of his huge wall uh, to keep out the illegal immigrants. So these... Uh, dividing walls have become a physical reality in many places and the list can go on if our world ever needed a a mediator between hostile groups a message of reconciliation it's today but that hostility is a lot closer to home it's not just on the international scale We see hostility 
and violence in marriages, in partnerships, in families between parents and children. And on the news uh, for some time, there's an increase in the case of domestic violence. And I'd like to say very clearly and publicly that there's no place for violence in a relationship. I've done some counselling over the years and often I hear, usually a man, not all, but a man will say, but she started it, she, she tormented me. I'd say, well, fine, but that doesn't give you an excuse for violence. We see violence happening in the traffic. Um, the road rage is, can be scary, where people can get incredibly violent because somebody was cut off or cut in front of or did something. And my, my theory is it's not about the traffic incident itself. It's about the stress that's built up leading up to that point. Uh, sometimes when something happens and somebody yells at you and abuses, you just wave at them and smile. <laughs> that usually makes them more angry, though. <laughs> <laughs> We've heard over the years of violent attacks on Asian students. Currently, and I find this crazy, uh, violent attacks on Jewish students in Australia and Iran. Now, Whatever your opinion about the situation in Israel and Gaza, what's that got to do with a, a Jewish student walking to uni or walking home, or any Jewish person? Why punish them for something that's happening thousands of miles away? But that's the conflict. It's, it's close to home. Fifty years ago, we were talking about the generation gap teenagers feeling alienated from parents and society. And after 50 years, and there's been a lot of uh, significant changes, you'd think we would have come up with a solution. But the situation hasn't really improved. It's deteriorated. There was a report of a teenager who killed his mother because she took away his computer. In the midst of all this hostility and separation, many people feel like they just don't belong, that they don't, just don't fit in. And, uh, and, it's, it's, and it's fa they're faced with what Paul calls the dividing wall of hostility. And he makes a bold statement. <clears throat> uh, just before I say that, uh, one of the, you hear a lot about the, the mass shootings in America where young people will go into a school and, uh, with a gun and, and just kill other students. One of the things they've been able to uh, ascertain from that is that these students have a history of uh, being isolated, bullied, that they feel like they don't belong and they develop a hostility and a hatred just to other people. And so there's a context to it. Um, so there's the stuff that's been building up. It's like the road rage. It's not what's happened in that classroom immediately. It's about years of what has built up. But this is the statement that Paul makes but now in Christ, you who were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. Now, no doubt there'll be many cynics who will quickly claim that Paul's beliefs or claim doesn't work. They'll say, look at the conflict. So many Christian countries, uh, even between denominations. Well, uh, 
it was a sad but funny scene I saw some years ago. And I think it was leading up to, uh, I think it was leading up to Christmas or either Christmas or Easter. And there's this special church in Jerusalem. Well, it was either Bethlehem or the place where Jesus buried, was buried or something. And these two monasteries, set groups of monks, were responsible for looking after this on some sort of a roster. And there was some sort of conflict about who was supposed to clean the courtyard. So these monks are arguing about, no, it's our turn to sweep, it, sweep this out. It's our honour, duty to honour Jesus by sweeping. And they started fighting and hitting each other with broomsticks and fighting because it was their turn to sweep the court's courtyard. And somebody filmed it. And I thought, what a sad testimony to the world that these Christians trying to serve Jesus were fighting. Anyway. But there are many examples. Uh, the, one of the, the classic examples people use is Northern Ireland. Um, Rwanda was a predominantly Christian country South Africa was and still is a strong Christian country, even at the height of the apartheid struggle. So people say, how can Christians on two conflicting sides be at war with each other? Does this prove that Christianity has failed? There was a, a Christian journalist author called G.K. Chesterton, uh, some of you might know him for his, uh, his uh, series, uh, Father Brown, that's been made into a TV series. And he made the comment, <clears throat> it's not that Christianity has been tried and found wanting, rather it was found hard, therefore not tried at all. But note that Paul does not say that the Christian religion is our peace, nor does he say the Christian church or any of its doctrines are our peace. He says that Jesus Christ is our peace and we are brought near by the blood of Christ, that is, his death on the cross. And that's part of the symbolism I've had these two flags for a number of years and I made this cross where they, they put together and I have it in my study and it keeps me... It's hard to know how to pray sometimes. And all I'm praying is that the blood of Christ, the cross, will bring these two groups together. Only God can do that. While Jesus called us to die for him and his kingdom, nowhere in the New Testament does Jesus ask any of his followers to kill or inflict suffering others for him or his kingdom. So when people go to war and they say, we go and fight in Jesus' name, no you don't. Uh, it's if you go to fight on behalf of your nation, on behalf of a cause, I'll honour that, respect that. But if somebody says, I go to fight and kill for Jesus, no, you don't. Jesus didn't ask you to kill for him. I know that might create a moral conflict with some soldiers, um, some people. Uh, um, what's that word? Not pacifists. Uh. Anyway, they refused to go into the army because of their conscience. Uh, conscientious objectors. Um, the cause of all hostility, division, and violence is essentially sin, selfishness, um, evil inspired by greed and power. And I think in Second Peter, I can't remember which chapter Peter says. What causes violence and hostility among us? Is it not our, our greed and our desire for what we can't have? 
So no matter how inspired our religious system, no matter how profound and biblical our doctrines, unless sin is dealt with and self-crucified, the best will always become corrupt and degenerate into a legalistic, divisive religion. Uh, Kevin and I were talking earlier about the, the Amish people who are pacifists, essentially. Oh, well, officially, they are. <laughs> but their desire to be simple, to have uh, some sort of degree of purity and, and uh, fully committed with that modern technology, they've become corrupted and they become a cult which oppresses their members. So even the purest of intentions, because of this sin that dwells within us, can create conflict. The problem is that many Christian groups and sects over the years, sects of the years, uh, there is conflict between the sexes as well, um, I just thought of a joke, but I'm just picturing my wife saying, don't go there, don't go there. <laughs> um, the groups, they feel the need to add something to the cross of Christ for, for us to secure our salvation and acceptance by God. So it becomes not simply Christ crucified and risen, saved by grace through faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. It says you must believe certain doctrines go to the right church, or do certain things. And if you don't, they punish you or kick you out. And that's, we were talking earlier about uh, the, the Amish people, Jehovah's Witnesses. If you don't keep their strict rules, you're punished. So they've added more than the cross. This then shifts the focus from Jesus to something else, a religious practice, a social action, or their prescribed moral personal purity. Now, these things in themselves have real value, but they are the fruit of our salvation, not the basis of our salvation. So f loyalty to a group, obedience to a set of rules, is because we're showing our appreciation. Forgiveness of sin, reconciliation with God is through Jesus Christ alone. Because Jesus alone removes that dividing wall of hostility between God, between us and God, and that barrier is sin. <clears throat> you see, the world may sincerely want and seek peace. But humans will never find reconciliation with each other until we are fully reconciled with God and our Creator. Many people turn religion, even the Christian religion, to gain, turn to it to gain some control over their lives or their environment. I've had people over the years that have, they were members of the church and they pulled out and said, what's going on? They said, well, I tried the religious thing and it didn't work. And oh, the words to, to that effect. Oh, I tried Christianity and it didn't give me what I wanted. And I thought, like G.K. Chesson, no, you didn't try it. You tried to follow certain things for your benefit. It's like they want to plug into some supernatural force to improve their lives. It's, it seems to have the thinking, if I become a Christian, my partner will change, my children will be better, my life will improve, my finances will improve. But friends, it doesn't work like that. The starting gate of the Christian life has always been to take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow Jesus. Then you become a better husband, a better wife, a better father or mother, a better neighbor, better friend, a better person, a 
But, but saying we must deny ourselves and take up the cross is not a very good sales pitch, is it? I mean, it's not the sort of thing. And that's why some TV evangelists say, I don't use that term because people don't like that. That doesn't attract viewers. I have to say, oh, you're so special. God loves you. Yeah, we're special to God. God loves us not because we're special. He loves us because he loves us. It's not a popular idea. It just happens to be the truth. The dividing wall of hostility comes down when Jesus deals with sin in my life. And Jesus put it, and I don't know we're talking about judging, he said, if, you, if you're condemning your, your, your brother, your sister, first take the log out of your own eye, deal with your own sin and faults, then you can see better what your friend needs to deal with. Take the speck out of their eye. Overcoming and finding peace um, is not a matter of gaining control through religious power, but surrendering our lives to Jesus Christ and giving him power over our lives. That's when Jesus, remember when Jesus said, if somebody strikes you, turn the other cheek. You ever thought about that? It just it seems crazy. But it's, it's saying Jesus defines what our responses are. Neither is peace found and hostility ceased by a naive uh, sense of self-denial to others. It's not about letting people walk over you. We do not create real peace with our children by giving them everything they demand. It doesn't create peace. Well, it may do for a few minutes, but it will create a bigger problem later. We don't create international or racial peace uh, by just giving people everything they demand. And friends, I think that's the problem with the conflict in Israel. If the world just says, give Hamas everything they want, it won't create peace. You know what it will create? The annihilation of Israel. Because it's in their charter. It's not just my opinion. They have said, Islam says, their goal is to completely destroy Islam. Not Islam. Um... Uh, the Jewish faith, Israel, till every Jew is killed. How can you appease that? That was a sidetrack. Back off quickly. Uh, by, but by giving up to the unrealistic demands of terrorists or radical groups, we don't bring peace. The dividing wall of hostility begins to crumble when we truly throw our lot in with Jesus and his kingdom. Then I'm not fighting to defend my rights, my views, or my political system. I'm under the lordship of Jesus Christ. See, Jesus doesn't come as a referee or a pacifier. He's bringing a positive alternative. His purpose, it says in verses 15 to 16, was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. So it's when whatever group it is come together under Jesus' authority, we find that oneness. It's not about saying, Palestinians, you've all got to become Jewish. Or well, Israel, you've got to now be called Palestine. That won't solve the problem. I don't know if you remember the old movie many years ago, uh, Oliver Cromwell with Richard Harris. And this amazing scene where there's a battle, all the, the royalists on one side, the roundheads or 
the, the Puritans on the other, and Oliver Cromwell sitting on this hill watching the battle. And then Oliver Cromwell, um, uh, I can't remember the exact words, but he's, and uh, up and down the ranks of the chaplains, and they're all calling out, be, be faithful, be brave, God is on our side. And Cromwell pensively asks, I wonder who's on God's side? Well, that's a classic example of English historical propaganda because uh, Oliver Cromwell didn't live up to what he claimed to believe, especially in Ireland. See, there's only one winning side, God's side. There's only one victor, Jesus Christ. And when the final battle is fought, only one kingdom will remain, and that will be the kingdom of God. So what are you asking of God today to help you fight your battles, to help you change your partner, your children, your neighbours, change your church to be what it, you want it to be? May your battle, maybe your battle is more spiritual than that. getting the church to see things our way. Uh, actually, Francis Frangipan, the speaker and author, said, it's not about your way or my way, it's Yahweh. I thought that was good. We always want the dividing walls of hostility to come down from the other side. It takes a real act of courage to start to bring the wall down from our side. But as we continually submit to Jesus, admitting our part of the hostility, confessing our own sins, then we see the walls begin to crumble. As Jesus said, you take the log out of your own eye, then you can see what you're dealing with. A question we looked at earlier and just some personal conflicts. Do you have the confidence and the security in yourself to let the other person have the last word? And everybody said, yes. Well, why did you ask that question? <laughs> Let's pray. Lord, we know it's not as simple as just saying love one another. We try. Lord, we need your help. We need your help in Israel, in Gaza, in the Ukraine, many countries around the world in Africa where there's conflict, where you'll raise up your people to have the courage to stand up for your kingdom. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
Let's pray. Holy and living God, we come to your table trusting your invitation and promise, merciful Lord, not trusting in our own goodness, but in your great and many mercies and grace. In ourselves, we're not worthy. And we're not worthy to do this, but through your death and resurrection of Jesus, you have demonstrated your great love for us. So we do this in Jesus' name. So in remembrance of Jesus, uh, let us follow the words and examples of Jesus as Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took the bread and the wine, the elements, and set them apart from their common everyday use for this holy mystery and purpose. And as Jesus gave thanks and blessed, we come with our prayer of great prayer of thanksgiving. So, Father, our God, we thank you that you demonstrated your love for us even before we knew you that even when we were lost in sin, you sent your only Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, to become one of us. He took upon himself our humanity, became obedient and willing to die for us on the cross. And we thank you that neither death nor a tomb could hold him, that you raised him to the highest place in your kingdom. We thank you for the gift and blessing of your Holy Spirit who empowers and inspires and equips us to follow and serve you. So, Lord God, by your word and spirit, bless and make holy this bread and this wine, that they may be for us the communion of the body and blood of Christ, that he may always live in us and we in him. And Lord, accept us as we offer and present ourselves, our souls and bodies, to be a holy and living sacrifice through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Saviour. Amen. We have reflected upon the Lord's Prayer. Now I invite you as we say the Lord's Prayer together now. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. And give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. So on the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body given for you. Take and eat it in remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood shared for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as we eat the bread and drink the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, if the service would come forward, I invite you to uh, receive the, the bread and wine of communion. This is uh, it's the table of the Lord Jesus Christ, not just the Uniting Church. So if you're in fellowship with Jesus, you're welcome to share this meal with us. So the body of Christ and the blood of Christ shed for you.
The body of Christ given to you and the blood of Christ keep you in eternal life. Thank you, Lord, for this time of connecting with you. Thank you that we've met you through your word and the sacrament that you've shown us, that you've given us your son, who's the true bread of heaven and food of eternal life. So strengthen us in your service that our daily living may show our thanks and our faith through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Mike. Now we come to God Talk. Does anybody have anything they want to, sh want to share? So. We went uh, for a walk uh, yesterday up a big rock, um, which is Depot Dam Rock. It's just a nice high one to have a look around. And we had uh, ten little children um, quietly walking up there. <laughs> Um, but we, uh, we were just kind of a little bit talking about it this morning and then we talked about it back in Sunday school, like if you go for a walk like that, and it's really, really lovely up there, um, if Jesus was walking with you what, you, what would you be talking to him about and what would you show him? And the kids in Sunday school picked up lots of lovely things. There was a big pile of rocks up the top because there's a... Mound, yeah, about this high, Tempe said, yeah, it's, it is that high and everyone puts a rock up there. Uh, so there's quite a mound up the top there when you, when you get up the top. Not, not like Mount Everest, but it feels like it sometimes. But um, uh, it, it was just an interesting um, thought to remember uh, what would you say to him. And then, and then in the reality is he was there. Um, and... and that we probably um, do a lot during our week and think that, yeah, you know, we have a big remembrance of him on Sunday, but you actually have to remember that he's actually with you each day and when it's not going so great, he's still there and when it's going really great, he's still there. And I just think it's a great reminder uh, when you think of simple things, you know, literally breaking it down quite simply with children that, um, yeah, we need to remember that. And I'm sure we do our week differently sometimes. I know that I would when you just consciously remember he's actually right by you uh, all the time. I'm taking the prayer of thanksgiving from Psalm 107 verses 1 to 9. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story those he redeemed from the land of the foe, those he gathered from the lands from east, west, north and south. Some wandered in desert wastelands, finding no way to a city where they could settle. They were hungry and thirsty and their lives ebbed away. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way to a city where they could settle. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. For he satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. This is the word of the Lord. Uh, could we have the helpers come and grab the offering, please? Thank you, Lord, for, for these gifts that we can give to you that your work may be done in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now we'll sing.
Jane, would you like to come up and do the prayers of intercession, please? Okay, are there any situations or people you would like us to pray for? Thank you, Debbie. I'll just take a minute to make sure I'm not going to make another mistake. I'm now going to sing our final hymn, When I Needed a Neighbour. Benediction comes from Ephesians 1, 3 to 6. Praise be to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him, in him before the creation of the world to the holy and blameless, to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he freely has given us in the one he loves. Amen. Please be seated. No, please stand while Steve takes out the Bible. Bible, 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 as a light to our feet. Oh, Lord, please do something with me. <laughs>